Good morning. Good morning. Happy Resurrection Day. He is risen. Amen. Well, we welcome you to our service here at Community Alliance Church this morning. We're glad that you chose to worship with us today. Um, we have some announcements this morning. They've been running on the TV, so I'm just going to go through some of them quickly. Um, first, we have, there's an elders meeting on Tuesday. We've got Wednesday every morning from 8 to 9. We meet uh, for the prayer power hour. It's very powerful. Um, if you can make it out between 8 and 9 a.m. on Wednesdays, you will not regret it. Um, we've got Thursday, the beginner's fly, tying, and fishing class. Um, Saturday, we've got the women's monthly Bible study. We've got next Sunday um, is we've got a spring egg hunt. So in your bulletin, you've got a flyer, an invitation that you can give to a family member. Um, does anybody want to say anything about that, Bryce? Good morning. So next week, as I've been announcing throughout the last two months and with announcements running, our, we're going to have our spring egg hunt. It's also going to be uh, our food fellowship for the month of April. Um, so for one, I want to thank everybody who brought in candy and prizes and filled eggs for me. I think we're close to 800 and I was going for around 500 eggs. So I've definitely got enough eggs for everybody. <laughs> um, so for next week, we are going to have a special guest for part of the service. And then kids are going, we're going to have the kids go back to community, uh, um, the community kids for carnival games. And then after that, we'll have our dinner and food fellowship. I as normal, bef the Sunday before our food fellowship, we're going to send around a sign-up sheet for uh, foods to bring. Um, I am going to be providing hamburgers and hot dogs on the grill. Um, I did put down on here on the sign-up sheet, I put a spot of, I will bring. Uh, I filled it in, and if somebody will sign up for it, it'd be great, is sliced tomatoes, onions, and lettuce. Um, so I will send that around. And please, as Heather said, with the uh, flyers that we have, please invite people. This is an outreach for, the, for our church. So thank you, and I'll see you next week. Does anybody else have any other announcements before we go ahead and start worship? No? All right, great. So this morning, I woke up with a song in my head, always. Um, and if it was fitting. It's a song by Zach Williams, and it's called There Was Jesus. Um, and it's, there, there's no more appropriate day than Resurrection Day when it's all about Jesus and um, he's no longer in that tomb. He's alive and um, it's just so exciting. So the, the, the chorus of the song says, In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing, in the hurting, like a blessing buried in the broken pieces, every minute, every moment, where I've been and where I'm going, even when I didn't know it or couldn't see it, there was Jesus. And on this resurrection day, I just want to remind you that no matter where you are in your life, no matter what you're going through, you are not walking alone. There is Jesus, and there will be Jesus with you every single step of the way. Would you please stand? We're going to go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll start singing. Jesus, we are just so thankful this morning that, that you are not in that tomb, that you have risen, you are alive, and that you are coming back again one day. God, we're just, we're overwhelmed this morning by that, um, by the fact that you could send your son to die on the cross for us who are so sinful. There's no way that we can fully understand that kind of love that you have for us but you have it for us your son has it for us and we thank you and we worship you this morning for everything that you've done for who you are for who your son is 
for everything that he does in our lives and will continue to do in our lives. And we pray that this worship this morning will be pleasing to your ears. In your name I pray, amen. Lost its 
our living hope this morning. There is nothing that you cannot do. The grave was not strong enough to hold you. And we just give you all of the praise and all of the glory this morning because it's all about you. You're holy. You're beautiful. And we praise you, God. We praise you. In your name I pray. Amen. You are the word at the beginning. One way.
And Jesus, we declare this morning that we want to live like a people who believe with all of our hearts that you have risen from that grave and that you are beautiful and wonderful and powerful and nothing can stand against you no matter what. You will always be bigger. Help us to keep our eyes on you, not just today, but every day, Jesus. Help us to help us to trust you. Help us to walk with you daily. Help us to learn to be more like you. And I pray for Pastor Jay as he comes to share the message that you put on his heart. I pray that you would just anoint him from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. Let him feel your presence so that he knows that the words that he's speaking come from you and not from him. And may those words that he speaks that are from you change us from the inside out this morning. In your name I pray. Amen. You may all be seated. Why is that there? She's doing something today. I don't know what this table is doing here, but uh, I just, if it had food in it, I'd be okay with that. You going to say something here? Go ahead, go ahead. on my mind while I was sitting back there and she's signing and I'm thinking she looks so pretty today so I just had to tell her and then I'm coming up the aisle and there's this lovely lady over here next to the wall and she's a visitor but she has a beautiful cast on her leg I mean I'm sorry you have a cast but it is beautiful it, it, it has flowers and it's purple people who love this church is full of people that love purple so you're lucky if they don't take that thing off your leg Okay, so now I'm not the stand-up comedian, even though I think some days I should have been. Um, I need children. Do you have, we have any children around here? Oh, yes, I'd like you. Do you want to come help me? How, will you be embarrassed? How old are you? Ten, oh, yes, come, you're ten. He's ten. Lovely, go ahead. And then there's this boy here in the blonde. And she knows she's coming. Come on, Lamar, we're going to have fun. Nobody's going to be looking. Guaranteed. They won't look. Dad will come with you. How's that? Mom will come with because Dad's just like Lamar. <laughs> He's hiding, too. Would you like to come? We're going to peel eggs. They're pretty colored. Please. Pretty please. I did all this work yesterday. And I got some good food, too. Rice Krispie Squares, you like them? Your grandpa could come with you. He doesn't mind being in front. I'm just going to grab them up. I don't care how I get them. Okay, you can all have a seat at the table. Pick out the pretty ha <laughs> ha. You want to get a seat at the table? You could sit by your sister. Here's your sister right here. You sit next to her. Okay. Hi. Hi, I don't know your name, but you have a little brother that looks just like you. Timmy or J Jimmy? Jimmy. And I forgot your name. You got to say it louder than that. Bianca? Dan. I know. He, her name's part race, race car. I don't remember all that. But. And then we have Lamar, who's shy. And we have his sister, Maddie, who's not. And then there's a couple back there. Anyway, we're going to talk about eggs today. So I'm sort of going to turn my back to these guys. Okay? I had some papers. Oh, I think I left them in my seat. I'll be right back. I could probably do it without them, but it scares me, you know? Okay. Thank you for the information. So how am I going to talk on this side? All my stuff's on that side. Not anymore. You're right. Oh, I don't need the bowl, because I'm not going to do this. I already did it yesterday. But I will bring this, because they're going to want this. Hopefully they anyway. Hi, guys. Hi. How you doing? Good. Y'all okay? 
Look at, I wanted to, I, yesterday, I noticed these, these eggs. I dyed eggs yesterday all by myself. Don't you feel bad for me? Yeah, and I was a nervous, I must have been a nervous wreck because I spilled water. I did all kinds of stuff. But you see this? There's a, that's supposed to be rose, but it's not very rose. And then there's this green one that has a, the green on the bottom is darker than the green on the top. But I wanted to, I wanted to show you something. See how big this egg is? And then see how this egg is? It's not, it doesn't have that sharp point on the top. Did you notice that? And then look at this egg. It's really bigger than that, this egg. Look at this little egg. Look how little that is. And how big this one is. Okay, I think they're trying to hook me up here. And then look at, this is the rose colored one. I like that one. Do you like that one? Do you like that one? Okay. And then, oh, this yellow one. <laughs> I was running out of dye, so I just cut the dye thing open and I put it all over the outside of the egg and now it's sticky. So we won't be using that one today. But you see how they're all different? When you look at each other, are you all the same? Exactly the same? Are you in the same mold? So they didn't pour you like into one of those donut things that you stick the stick in and they're all round in the same way and they're all the same color, right? So you're all different, right? Eggs and coins. Oh, thank you. He's just good. Anyway, so just like these eggs are different, you guys are different, right? And I'm different? Yeah. And so that's something that's really important because I'm going to give you all an egg. You have, a, you have a color you like since we have all these? You like pink? Is that sort of pink? Or this one? That one? I have to go faster. The preacher's going to get mad at me. That's that sin nature we're going to talk about today. So, now what you're going to do, I have to get my phone, my phone. Can somebody put their phone on timer and put it for one minute, please? If you all want to do it, that would be fine. Okay, so now in one minute, I need you to peel your egg. Okay? I need you to peel your egg, but this isn't, it isn't really, yeah, but it isn't really a contest to see who does it first. But we only have a minute, so that's. Oh, I'm going to tell them. So when I tell you, you know how they say, ready, set, start, that's what I'm going to do. And that's how that guy will know. His name is, um, I can think. Okay, so anyway, they're going to hit the timer when I say go, okay? So you're all ready? Or you, you need to get up on your knees or something or talk, stand up because you're tall enough? Are you tall enough, Lamar, to get your eggshells in your bowl? That's the other thing. I gave you the bowls. Well, try to get as many eggshells in the bowl as you can, okay? Okay. Okay, so we're ready, okay. set, go. Pound it. Pound it hard. You got to pound it harder than that. You got to get them shells loose. Now, we're looking for the perfect egg when you get done. Come on, come on, hurry. There's one minute. Got to hit it harder. Do you need me to hit it for you? I'm really good at that. Oh, wow, you're doing really good. Oh, you're doing good, too. Keep going. That's okay. That's okay. Just keep peeling. We just want the outside off. It doesn't matter what comes off with it. Keep going, Lamar. Hurry up. The minute's almost over. Good job. Wow, she can come to work at my restaurant. I don't really have one. Did you get it down there, Jimmy? Jim? Tim? I don't remember. Time, you're done. Okay, so now look at your egg. 
I did mine yesterday when it was still hot. So, so it, look at how perfect it is. Look at, there's no skin that came off. Yours is pretty good too. But then I had this other one. Look what it did. It's got a dimple in the bottom and it broke in half and it just looks terrible. It's not very perfect. There's no dimples in them. You never pulled any of the white off. Look at, see, like, see, look at your egg. See that? You did a really good job, but, but look at here. There's a little bit of white on there. So the whole idea is that just like our eggs aren't perfect, just like the eggs were all a different size, okay, we're not perfect. Are we perfect? No. No, we're not perfect. Yeah, there's some white on that one. So yours didn't work quite as well, did it? So we're, none of us are perfect. And guess what? Our parents aren't either. They're not perfect either. And you know what? Um, do you know what was hard about peeling your egg? Anything? Nothing was hard? Did you have anything hard down there? No? Oh, my, they're so good. I just can't believe it. Okay, so do you think that your eggs are all perfect? Can we cut them in half and take out the yolks and smoosh up the yolks and put them back in and the egg won't be like sort of funny looking? Oh, they're perfect. Okay, I got a problem. Because I got this egg that doesn't look perfect at all. It sort of looks... The other one does. Yeah, the other one does, but this one doesn't. We're going to talk about imperfect things, things that aren't perfect. We're not perfect. So when we look at our eggs... They all look different before we peeled them, right? None of them were the same, just like none of us are the same. But then when we peeled them, we got funny things sometimes, didn't we? Where we got little, we, lo we lost some of the yolk on the, on the eggshell, and then somebody got perfect down there, I don't know. And so we're all different, but on the inside, we're sort of all the same. Because you know what? When Eve was in the garden, and so was Adam, and there was this tree that was perf this tree that they were told not to touch. Well, were they told not to touch it? Maybe they were told not to eat it. That when they when they ate the fruit, then they would change. And they ate the fruit and it changed them. Because before they didn't even know there was anything bad in the whole world. They didn't. They didn't do bad stuff. They did exactly what they were supposed to do. And then they ate that fruit, and all of a sudden they could tell all these bad things. And they could tell all the good things, and they could see how that messed them up. So, there's only one person in all of the world that doesn't have this inside of them that makes them want to do bad. That thing that makes us want to do bad on the inside is called a sin nature. It's called sin. And because of it, we do things sometimes, not because we want to, but just because it happens. Like we get really mad because our doll's dress won't go on right, or our truck, the wheels fell off of it. And that makes us mad because we want it to work. We want to be able to play with it. And sometimes we just get mad because mom says it's bedtime. And we want to stay up longer, right? Yeah, and sometimes we just get hurt because other people hurt us. And sometimes we just feel lost. Not because we're really lost, we just feel sort of lost. These are all feelings that we have in our heart that we wouldn't have had if Adam and Eve hadn't touched that fruit, disobeyed God. So none of us are perfect on the inside, 
just like none of the eggs were perfect on the inside when we peeled them, right? But there's only one person that was perfect on the inside. Did you know that? One person. And it says in the Bible, he, Jesus Christ, never sinned, nor ever deceived anyone. Deceived. Huh. Is that when you, mom says to eat your peas and you sort of hide them so she can't see that you didn't eat them? Right, that's deceiving. When we tell mom we brushed our teeth and we didn't when we went to bed, that's being deceiving and that is a sin because that's being disobedient to your parents. And God said if you disobey your parents, you're disobeying God. Pretty tough, eh? But the pastor's going to tell you a story today, which I'm also going to tell you that in Romans 5, 8, it says, but God showed his great love for us because Jesus loved us so much by sending Christ Jesus, his son, while we were still sinning, while we were still telling our moms things that weren't true and our dads, when we were pushing people on the playground when, because we were angry with them, when we were doing all these things, Jesus, God sent Jesus to, to bring his love to us by dying on a cross and today we're celebrating because it says that he rose from the victory. Rose. He's our victory. He brought us love. What do you think of that? So and then it says that if we love Jesus and we ask him to forgive this sin in us, that he, we can do everything through Christ who gives us strength. We can do everything through Christ. So as if you ask Jesus to be your Savior, to forgive your sins, and he comes and he lives in your heart, you can ask him to help you to brush your teeth when you don't want to, to go to bed when you're supposed to, to not get angry as often. You will get angry still, but you just keep asking Jesus to forgive you and to come in and help you with your anger, and he will help you, and you can grow more like Jesus every day, if I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Then there's another thing that I wanted to share with you. It says to give all the things that you're worried about or you're afraid of, you're supposed to cast them on God for he cares for you. So tonight when you go to bed, if you're afraid of something, if you're worried about something that you heard, you can go to Jesus and you can say, Jesus, I'm really worried. I'm really scared. So will you please help me? Will you come and sit with me here tonight? And he will, and he'll be with you. And every time you worry, every time you're afraid, you can call Jesus, and he will come and be with you. Okay? So now, for you that are going to be in here during church and you are too, you know, didn't want to come up front. Okay, I have brought, let's see, these, I didn't know who could have peanut butter and who couldn't. And I don't make Rice Krispie squares without peanut butter, huh? This is for them to have during service. Okay, so I have an egg for you. You could take them to the nursery, okay?
The problem is they left this egg enticingly looking at me here. But I'll push it over there. Get Yeah. Get thee behind me, Satan. All right. Huh? Okay. All right. Good morning. Thank you, Sister Sharon, for that time with the kids. I uh, just wanted to let you know if you were here today and you've uh, we ran out of bulletins. So if you, you're here today and you're a visitor and you don't have a bulletin, can you please raise your hand? You're here today and you do not have a bulletin. You're visiting with us. Someone, you're, you're from the church. Yes. Someone who is from our church, can you pass out that bulletin to someone who needs one? If you're here today visiting without a bulletin. We should have made more. I apologize for that. Okay, secondly, uh, if you're here today for the very, very first time, we have a special gift for you. So we'd like for you to raise your hand. We have a gift for you. If you can just raise your hand, we want to put something into your hands. I know there's a few people here, so in the name of Jesus, I pray that you just raise your hand. I mean, let us know you. All right, there's one. Thank you. Uh, Paul, Ra raise your hand one, one more like this. And just raise your hand, please. There's people giving out something. Just raise your hand like this. Paul, right here. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you for visiting with us today. We pray that uh, you enjoy our service. Uh, so today, actually I meant to say last Sunday, officially on, on Sunday, the second was six years since I've been in this church. Six years. So praise the Lord. They went so fast, right? Wow. And, and I, need to, I need to say this morning that you have been wonderful, church. Uh, thank you, leaders and church, supporting your prayers, your encouragement. Uh, you've been wonderful, and I just praise God. Thank you for your prayers. Your prayers are very important. And so um, we're a family. Amen? Amen. So uh, I wanted to, uh, to read something to you this morning. I was going to cut it down, but I'm going to read it anyway. Uh, how many of us came to hear from the Lord? Amen. So here's something, it sounds, it sounds like a joke, but it's actually not. It's a tragedy. But uh, it happened in Spain, in Barcelona. A truck was rolling along carrying an empty coffin. A farmer, a farmer who was hitchhiking, thumbed the ride. He was bouncing along in the rear of the truck, which was, uh, which was open uh, when it started to rain. And he examined the coffin, opened it up, looked inside, found that it was empty, and he crawled inside to keep dry. And, and, and then he fell asleep. F further on, two other hitchhikers got on ride in the truck. They were going along at a lively clip when the farmer inside the coffin pushed open the lid, stuck his head out and observed, oh, it stopped raining. The two other hitchhikers were so terrified that they leaped from the speeding truck and one was killed. But nonetheless, think about that, right? Think about that. Um, I think any of us would have jumped out that truck. <laughs> uh, it, it, if you had heard that someone was dead, right? If you heard that someone w was, was no longer living, no longer with us, and, and all of a sudden you found that that person was indeed alive, would it have some kind of an impact in your life? Absolutely, it would get our attention, right? And, and, and I'm here to declare this morning that um, Jesus is alive, that he lives, that he's still changing lives. And, 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 and the proof of the pudding is this, a, a dead God cannot change lives. And for, for centuries and centuries and centuries, generations and generations, Jesus is still changing lives. So there's no way if he were dead, he can change lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. So just the thought there. Let me ask you a question. Do you have, how many of you have a garden? You have a garden? Uh, or ever had a garden before, right? Uh, gardens are beautiful, aren't they? Gardens, some of them are, are bigger than others, and some of them are, are fancier than others, and some of them are for show. Some of them are to, to be observed, to look at, to admire. Some of them are for, build or, or for, for developing food, right? For vegetables and, and fruit and stuff like that. Uh, but nonetheless, there's one thing about a garden. Every garden has a story behind it. Uh, in, in other words, every garden that is had or that is being t uh, tended to is a garden that 
there's a story behind it. There's a purpose, whether it be to grow food or whether it be to, uh, to grow food to help neighbors or people who are needy or whether it's just as a pastime, a habit, a hobby, or something uh, to, to, to gain some form of accomplishment or success. Every garden has a story behind it. And so today I want to talk to you about I want to talk to you about gardens. In fact, I want to talk to you about three gardens that are specifically mentioned in the Bible. The title of our message is up on the screen. The Tale of Three Gardens. The Tale of Three Gardens. Would you please stand with me and join me in prayer? Oh, yes, please stand with me and join me in prayer. Hallelujah. Blessed name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for your grace and love. Father, in the name of Jesus, I commit every heart that is standing right now into your keeping. Thank you that you see every heart, you see every life, you see where we're at, you see uh, what's going in our lives. You know every circumstance, every situation, you know every hidden thing, you know every challenge, every trial, every conflict. You know everything about everyone standing before you right now. And so, God, we commit these hearts to you in Jesus' name. And we invite you, Spirit of God, uh, to speak to our hearts. Spirit of God, you have such an impact in our lives. You raised Jesus from the dead, and we pray today that you would raise up our own hearts. We pray that you would, you would soften hearts and quicken our hearts, and that you would bind every plan and every attempt and every strategy and every scheme of the devil in the name of Jesus, and that we would be free to hear your word, that you would unclog our ears and soften our hearts, and above all, Holy Spirit of God, that you, would, uh, that you would glorify, that you would exalt the living, the living, the resurrected one, Jesus, that you would exalt his name. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men, all people unto me. And so, Holy Spirit, we commit every heart to you, even the hard ones, even the ones that don't want to believe, even the ones that, uh, Lord, are close to you. We thank you and praise you that you're in the business of softening hearts and opening hearts and opening ears and quickening lives and drawing still to you and we praise you living christ would you be glorified today we pray in jesus name amen <clears throat> so so gardens in the bible were, were were could be they were they you know they were plantations uh they were uh, orchards. They were all kinds of things that had all kinds of meanings and purpose. But usually a, a garden was built near a city wall. And it was built near where there was a good flow of water. And, and, and often the main purpose, though not always, of a, of a garden was, was for food supply. It was for food supply. And so let's notice, let's look at some of these gardens, these gardens that I mentioned today. I want you to notice up on the screen, let's talk about the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden. Notice Genesis chapter 2, a couple of verses from there. Verse 8 says, Now the Lord God planted a garden in the east. By the way, that is our springboard text for today's message. Now the Lord God planted a garden in the east, in Eden. And there he put the man that he had formed. And the Lord God uh, took the man and put him in the garden, verse 15, uh, in the garden of Eden to work it and to care for it. And then in verse 18, it says that the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone and I will make him a suitable helper. It is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a suitable helper. That helper, of course, was Eve, a woman who in verse 25 is also called his wife. Uh, and, 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 and so God is the one that builds this particular garden. God is the one that calls upon this garden and make it happen. This was a time in the Garden of Eden where intimacy with God and with nature was natural. It was consistent. It was all the time. God builds this plant, this, this garden, and begins to draw attention to who he is. And think about this for a moment. So Adam and Eve at this time are... Are physically and spiritually alive and they're well. And Satan, the devil, whom in John 16 11 Jesus calls the prince of this world or the ruler of this world, and in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4, Paul calls him uh, the, 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 the one who comes to deceive, 
the one who is the God of this world. Well, Satan here in the Garden of Eden at this point had absolutely no authority, no dominion, no power whatsoever. The one that had the authority in the Garden of Eden was Adam. He's the one with the power. He's the one with the authority. God had placed everything into his care. God had given him dominion over everything. The animals of the sea and of the skies and of the ground. They had them. He had dominion over them. He gave them names. And the animals, by the way, were at this point friendly with one another. They all hung out together. The garden was wonderful. Everything was at the disposal of Adam and Eve. And, and he names them. And, and, and even the, the plants, the seed-bearing plants, and, and for the most part, the, the seed-bearing trees, everything in the garden was at the lap of Adam and Eve to enjoy and to rule over. Everything was wonderful in the Garden of Eden. That we need to understand that within this garden, there was a propensity for something good and something evil, right? And although Adam and Eve were perfect at this point, they were warned or they were immediately introduced to the fact that, that they had the freedom to choose and do as they wanted to, but that there were consequences to the choices that they made. And so sure enough, what happens uh, in this garden out of nowhere, eventually comes uh, discouragement and comes disobedience. There was a tree that they were to, to leave alone. They could eat from any tree in the garden, but there was one tree called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree wasn't poison, church. They didn't die when they ate of the tree, physically speaking. But there was a tree that drew a line it drew a line. It helped them to know, to understand that there was a standard. And that standard had to do with God. And they were told, you can eat of any tree of this garden, but don't eat of this one. It was to test their obedience. It was to test their commitment. It was to show them that they, that they weren't the boss, that there was someone who created them who had the final word. And so sure enough, eventually one day, he comes into the garden with disobedience in his mind. He comes in with a word of suggestion, but nonetheless with manipulative purposes. And he breaks the heart of God. Adam and Eve, who had walked with God, who had enjoyed fellowship with God, disregarded the word of God, disregarded what God said, put aside everything that God said, and allowed this slimy, sneaky serpent, Satan, to take the Word of God from their hearts and from their minds and to introduce them to something much more better as far as he was concerned, though it was deceptive. And what happened in this wonderful Garden of Eden is that Adam and Eve and what they had with God would never, ever be the same. The connection, the intimacy, the harmony with God was now scarred. It, it broke the heart of God. And it broke his relationship with his people, his creation. Adam, Adam and Eve were deceived that the serpent, the devil, came in there. And, and what he did was he ripped apart. He broke in half. He disunited. He separated harmony with God and his people. And church, please hear this. If there's anything you need to hear today, oh, there's got to be more. Is that the devil has always intended to disconnect God from the people he loved enough to create. It's always been his plan. It will always be his plan. And please hear this. It will always be his plan. The only way that the devil can separate you and me from hearing, from being in tuned with, to being conscious of, to receiving, to following, to hearing, to knowing, to living for, is to keep us from the word of God. Oh, if he can snatch this book from your daily life. If he can take that book away from your daily life. I don't have time to read. I don't have time to pray. I don't have to, time to listen to God's voice. I'm busy. I got a strong schedule today. He has won the battle for that day. And he'll do it again tomorrow. And it'll happen on Thursday and Friday as well. And, and, and so what he does is he breaks and he's still working at it. it it's working. It's working. It's worked for years. 
hundreds and thousands of years. And so I'm going to continue to attack the word of God in their lives. He doesn't care about God. That name doesn't scare him. Everybody is worshiping some kind of God, whether it be the God of self or the God of money or the God of you name it. But he cares about the word of God because this exposes him and exhorts him. And so I call the Garden of Eden, I call it the Garden of Sin. I call it the Garden of Sin, this beautiful, colorful, awesome, with water and oil garden that God provided for his people, where there was harmony and intimacy with God. Unfortunately, I call the Garden of Sin because it was in this garden, the Garden of Eden, that sin entered into the world. It was in the Garden of Eden that the devil tempted and Adam and Eve fell to his temptations and his lies and they fell. And so sin entered into the Garden of Eden. Secondly, I want you to notice the Garden of Gethsemane up on the screen. The Garden of Gethsemane. Matthew 26, 36 then Jesus went with the disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. Sit here while I go over there and pray. The Bible doesn't have a whole lot to say about the features of the Garden of Gethsemane, but it has a whole lot to say about the occurrences thereof. Jesus has his Passover time he celebrates the Passover with the disciples, and from there they go over to the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Garden of Gethsemane was an awesome garden in that it was the place where Jesus often went and he sat with his disciples and he fellowshiped with them and he took time to rest and they took time to pray together. But the Garden of Gethsemane wasn't nice to Jesus on this day. It would become the garden where Jesus, <laughs> where he would lose the connection. It would be a garden where his people, his followers would disown him. It would be the garden where Judas Iscariot would betray Jesus and get him arrested. And on the night before Jesus' uh, crucifixion, he would be the one that gave Jesus the kiss of death. The garden of Gethsemane is the garden where the disciples disowned Jesus where the true colors were seen, where the flesh took over the spirit and the connection that they had with God. It was the garden where, where Peter would deny knowing Jesus three different times, not once, but three times. It was quite a garden. It was a garden where Jesus wrestled much. In verse 37, it says that Jesus, Jesus, please hear this, Jesus was, was sorrowed. Sorrow and he was troubled. He had much sorrow and he was troubled. And the word sorrow there means to be horrified. Same Greek word, he was, he was horrified as he wrestled with the thought of the upcoming crucifixion. As he wrestled with the thought of carrying the weight of the sin of the whole world, including yours and mine this morning. As he wrestled with the agony and the torment that was soon to come, Jesus was sorrow. In verse 38, it says that, that he, was, he was overcome. He was overcome with sorrow to the point of death. Jesus, there in the Garden of Gethsemane, looked at death face to face, and he was sorrowed. He was overtaken by what was about to come. In verse 39, it says that Jesus threw himself at the foot of God, and laying on the ground with his face to the ground, he cried out to God. He cried out to his Father. And he said, oh God, oh God, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Remove it from my life. Is there a better way, God? Is there another alternative? Would you please take this cup away from me? And he cried out to God, and there was no voice whatsoever. He didn't hear from God the Father. And so in verse 40, he goes to the disciples. He told them to stay up and to watch, to watch. And, and he gets there, and they're, they're all sleeping. They're falling asleep. They weren't there. Their, their hearts were not with Jesus. And Jesus says in verse, in verse 41, he says, he says to Peter, Peter, watch and pray. 
that you fall not into temptation. He says the spirit is willing, but, but the flesh is weak. And it was that same Peter who did not listen to what Jesus was saying. It's that same Peter who, though he read his word for his devotion, did not listen to what he heard during that devotion. It was that same Peter that Jesus are told to stay there and watch, who was told, make sure, otherwise temptation will overtake you, who would several hours later deny knowing Jesus three times. How many times has God in his word warned us, encouraged us regarding something, and the next day we let it go? In verse 42, he goes back to the Father and, and again cries out to God and cries out to God and says, Lord, please take this cup away from me. Church, please hear this. Jesus did not want to go through the agony of Calvary. There was just too much there for him. But he still would say, yet not my will, but your will be done. But again, no word, no encouragement, nothing. And so in verse 43, he goes back to the disciples. Jesus is looking for someone to place their hands on him and say, it's going to be okay. He's looking for someone to say, to say to him, God will take you through. God will deliver you. God will take you to remember his promise. But he could find no one. His disciples' eyelids were too heavy. And again, they were falling asleep. And Jesus again goes back to the Father. In verse 44, he goes right back to the Father. See, he's going from the Father to the disciples, to the Father, to the disciples. Can you imagine the agony, the weight, the heaviness, his emotions, the pain that he was going through as he thought about the cross? The pain, the, the scorn, the thorns, the crown of thorns and the nails. He thought of everything. He thought about your sin and my sin. And my sin perhaps would be that much more bigger than yours, but he thought about the weight and the heaviness of all these sins. And he goes to the disciples and still nothing. The Father wasn't there. The disciples weren't there. Finally, he goes to the disciples after going to the Father again and he says to them, are you still sleeping? Get up. My, my betrayer has come. The gloom of the Garden of Gethsemane. If, if you and I could just take a, a walk to Gethsemane just for a little while. If we could just, if, if, if we could just there sit as, as, on the side and, and, and watch what was going on here. Jesus goes to the disciples three times. For a word of encouragement. You ever need a word of encouragement? Anybody ever need a word of encouragement? You want it, don't you? Looking for a word of encouragement. Looking for a, 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 a word of promise. Looking for a, a, an arm to put, be put on his shoulders. Looking for someone to cry with him. Or for someone to get on their knees and pray on his behalf. Or pray for him. And he found nothing. And three times he goes to the Father. Three times he goes to, 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 to his father. He calls upon his name. And he, he's waiting for a voice of encouragement. There, there was, listen, there was no sight of God. There was no, no sound whatsoever. Nothing, nothing from heaven. What's challenging here is that in John 17, 5, Jesus, Jesus declares that he was with God the Father from the foundations of the world. They always hung out together. There was never a time when they were apart. There was never a time when, when one was here and one was there. Jesus says in John chapter 5, he says, I don't do anything unless I see the Father doing it. My eyes are always on him. I depend on him. I rely on him. I hold on to him. I follow his design for my life. And there in the Garden of Eden, God was not there. Why? What did he do? Why wasn't God there for his beloved son there in Gethsemane? The weight, the heaviness of sin was on Jesus. Um, church, and, and you think about in order to forsake, someone had to be forsaken by sin. And I praise God today that at the cost of Jesus, um, 
I was not forsaken because of the agony and the pain that he went through there at Gethsemane that would eventually take him to the cross. It was a sad day there in Gethsemane because everything that he had in, enjoyed with the disciples was just taken from him like that. Incidentally, the, so the word Gethsemane means oil press. And someone has said this, I'm going to read it to you. Someone has said that the pressure of God's upcoming wrath for your sin and my sin was pressing in on Jesus and was literally squeezing the life out of him. That's the turmoil that Christ went through at Gethsemane. The pain, the difficulty, and the challenge for you and for me. Think about that. I call the Garden of Gethsemane the Garden of Suffering. Because it was there in Gethsemane that my Savior and my God and my Lord and yours as well, if you know him this morning, um, it was there that he grieved. It was there that, that he was overtaken, that he was overwhelmed, that his emotions were being attacked. It was there that Jesus felt all alone. Uh, he felt abandoned. That, that must have been the worst. The worst for Jesus to encounter there at Gethsemane, uh, it, it had to be. Not so much the pain that he's going to bear at the cross and the heaviness of your sin and my sin. The worst part of everything there, the, the hurt, the most hurt that he had, had to come from the fact that he was abandoned by his father. That his dad was not there for him. That must have been the biggest pain he felt, though there was so much emotion and so much pain right there at Calvary as he headed to Calvary. And within hours, what happens is that Jesus is he's, he's betrayed and abandoned by his disciples, and, and, and then he's arrested. He's, 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 he's arrested. He's judged as a criminal. He's condemned to die and nailed to a cross within hours. And it all began at Gethsemane because of you and me. The Garden of Gethsemane. Notice lastly the Garden of Joseph of Arimathea. Up on the screen, the, jo the, the Garden of Joseph of Arimathea. John 19, 41 up on the screen. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in the middle of the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever laid. There was a garden, and in the middle of the garden, there was a new tomb in which no one had ever laid. Notice next up on the screen, Matthew 27, 57 through 60. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked Jesus for Jesus' body, and, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a stone, a big stone, in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. It was easy to roll these stones into the groove of the entrance. These stones were told weighed. They were eight, eight feet in diameter. They were round granite rock, the heaviest rock of the day. And they were one foot thick and weighed over four tons, which would be 8,000 pounds. So it's easy to roll someone, something like that into a groove. It's impossible for humans to open it up. And so Joseph was a member, he was a member of the, of the Sanhedrin. He was a member of those who would eventually be the ones to condemn Jesus to death. He was a part of the Sanhedrin. This is what makes this it's, it's power, powerful how God can work through people's lives. And, and, and so this same Joseph was, was an upright man. He was a good man. He was a man with much and a man with heart. But he loved his God. I said, Joseph loved his God. There he grew the olives and the oaks. And there he had the flowering, <laughs> the flowering tulips and the daisies and, and, and the poinsettias. And he had the roses. And, and he had all these colorful, shiny looking, beautiful trees there in his garden. He loved his garden. He even hired a gardener for the times when he wasn't there so that his garden was always being 
tended to, always being taken care of. It was his garden. He worked so deeply and so hard with his own hands. He worked so hard. He labored to also put inside that garden, think about that, a tomb. That's what made this garden an unusual garden. He, jo Joseph had a tomb in his garden, which he built by himself. Why in the world would Joseph or anyone want to have a tomb in their garden? What was he thinking? M maybe he had a prophetic word, right? Or maybe, may maybe it was impressed upon his spirit. God does that. It was impressed upon him that, that he would be using that for something one day. I don't know. But what I do know is that it was in that garden that the body of Jesus would be laid. It was in that garden that he built for whatever reason that he worked so hard to make happen uh, that, that Jesus' lifeless body would be laid one day. And so this guy Joseph was... was um, he belonged to the Sanhedrin. He was a convert. He was a, he was a secret follower of Jesus. He was a, he was, he was, he hidden for, he hid it from the people. He would have been in trouble. So he was a secret disciple, a secret follower of Christ. And, 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 and when he found out that Jesus died, I would imagine that he developed enough courage within himself to go to Pilate and tell Pilate if he can have the body of Jesus. And Pilate, having had heard that Jesus died, he was pierced to the side, with, which was proof that he died. He stopped living. He stopped breathing. Pilate tells him that he can take the body. Think about this for a moment. A governmental official standing up for Jesus. My gosh. Boy, do we need that today. We're not talking about governmental officials that are religious. A governmental official that stood up for Jesus, that would speak on his behalf, knowing that if it was found out, he would lose his life. And so he stands up for Jesus, and he gets the body of Jesus, and he plants it, or he puts the body of Jesus right there in the garden. Well, what happens is, uh, this was a special garden. It was a special garden because no one had ever laid in there. It was brand new. It never had a dead person inside of it. It was a special garden because a special person was placed in that garden. It was a special garden because... Three days later, the tomb was open. We told in, in the book of Matthew that, that an angel came by way of an earthquake and he removed the stone that no human being alone could remove. And when that tomb was open, they found that the body of Jesus was no longer there. Hallelujah. They found that the lifeless body was no longer there. They found the coverings, but they didn't find the body and it was Jesus who time and time again told the disciples. And he told his enemies, destroy this temple, I will raise it in three days. It was Jesus who throughout Scripture told throughout the Gospels. And, and we find it throughout the Old Testament. In Isaiah 53, right? We, find, we, 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 we learn about the, the, the death of Christ. We learn about the burial of Christ. We learn in Psalm in, in Psalm 22, we find about the, 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 the cross, the situation with the cross. In Psalm 16, we learn about the one who would rise from the dead. He would conquer death. God will not uh, betray him there in the garden. That God would raise him up at Calvary. Within the very garden, God would raise him up through the Holy Spirit. And so it was an awesome garden. It was a special garden. It was a garden where our Christ who was pierced to prove that he was dead, conquered death. I don't know about you this morning, but, but in fact, I want you to do me a favor. Jack, just open that door for a moment. Jack, please. That door right there. Just open that door for a moment. I want the whole community to hear this morning that Jesus is alive. On the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. Jesus lives!
lives. One more time. Some of them are sleeping. Jesus lives. Ready? One, two, three. Jesus lives. Hallelujah. You can close it now. Thank you, Jack. You're all right. You're all right. Jesus is alive. He lives. Listen to me. He lives. I'm not telling you that because I read it in this book. I'm not telling you that because a pastor told me or a friend told me. I'm not telling you because some crazy people in church talk about it. I'm telling you because I gave him a chance to prove to me that he lives, and he has indeed shown me that he lives. He changes lives. He's faithful to his word. Let me read to you some verses up on the screen. Matthew 28 and verse 6. Uh, it was an angel who said this. He is not here. They went to look for Jesus. They went to see the dead body. He's not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Mark 16 and verse 6, an angel says, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene. He was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they lay him. Two angels said in Luke 24 and verse 6, they said, do not be alarmed, he said. He said, you are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. Hallelujah. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Jesus is real. Jesus is true. Jesus is still changing lives. The death could not hold him. The grave could not keep him. The lifelessness of his Jesus at that moment could not overtake him and consume him. That's why in 1 Corinthians 15, 55, it says, Where, oh, where, oh, death is your victory? Where, oh, where is your sting? Death has been conquered. Death has been overtaken. Jesus has provided a way, a channel for you and me to experience life. It's all because of him. I would imagine... <sighs> I would imagine that, that when that tomb was open, that the birds began to sing louder. I would imagine that when that tomb was open, the flowers began to blossom quicker and bigger and fuller. I would imagine that when that tomb was open, the trees began to sway as if, as if dancing. And the ground developed smiles beyond because the resurrected one was alive. I can hear Jesus saying, I am the living one. I was dead. I am the living one. I was dead. I am the living one. I was dead. But behold, I hold life. I've overcome. I've taken the keys of Hades away from the devil. Behold, I am alive forever and ever. And, and, and so there was Satan thinking he won this great victory. There was Jesus on the cross, uh, and there's the crown of thorns, uh, and there's the, the, the piercing to his side. And there he says it is finished, and therefore he stops breathing, and, and he gives up the Holy Ghost. He gives up his ghost. His spirit is gone, and he's thrown into, a group, into the tomb. And, and there is Satan saying, it's happened. <laughs> I hold the keys of death in my hands. <laughs> and little did he know that three days later, Later. <laughs> Hallelujah. Jesus will come and take that key and swipe it out of his hand. I'm the Lord of life. I've conquered sin. I've conquered death. I've conquered life. I am the giver of life. That's what it was like. Think about that. As Jesus entered and, 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 and rose from the dead, the power of God resting upon him. Church, let me say this. In, in, in Romans 8, 11, it says that, that the Holy Spirit is the one that raised Jesus from the dead. In John 6, 6, 3, Jesus says, the Spirit gives life. The Spirit gives life. You see it throughout Scripture. You see it in Genesis. So the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. And I want you, please hear this. I want you to know that today, this morning, in this church, the resurrected Christ and the power of the resurrection of Jesus through His Spirit is in this church today. Yes, the Bible says we've died. Adam and Eve didn't die. Jesus, the Bible says, God said, if you eat of this tree, you will surely die. Well, they didn't die physically. They died spiritually. And the Bible says in James chapter 2 that, that without the Spirit, we're dead. Spiritually dead. The resurrected Christ, the Spirit of the Lord is here to raise up people lives listen there is no barrier there is no obstacle there is no sin there is no failure there is no shame there is no uh, stronghold there is no lies there is no deception that can keep you bound and strapped and chained 
in any way once you invite Jesus to come, the resurrected Christ, to come and raise within you a heart that needs to know Him and experience Him for newness of life. There is no demon in hell that can keep us strapped if we know the living Christ. None in hell, church. None in hell. And so Jesus is alive. He's living. He is who He is. So if, 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 if in the Garden of Eden... If in the Garden of Eden, if we call that sin, and in the Garden of Gethsemane, we call that suffering, the Garden of Joseph of Arimathea I call success. Because it was there that Jesus conquered and overcame and triumphed, triumphed over sin. Jesus will never, ever, ever again taste death. He conquered it once and for all. He is the giver of life. He is the sustainer of life. He is who he is because of who he is. Amen? Amen. So let me, let me just share this as I get ready to close. <clears throat> I want to talk to you about another garden here very quickly. Up on the screen, if you notice, <clears throat> I want to close by saying these words. That there is a God in every one of our hearts this morning. There's a God in every one of our hearts. And we're the ones that are tending this garden. You're tending the garden in your heart. You're tending the garden in your heart. Unless you give it over for someone else to tend it for you. Notice upon the screen the next slide, Isaiah 58 and verse 11. It says, the Lord will guide you always. This is God's word. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land, and he will strengthen your frame. Please hear this. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. You will be like this well-watered garden, the strongest Gardens that there is, the best, best kept gardens for the water. And notice the next slide. Let's look at his garden. See, that garden deep within your heart and within my heart um, <clears throat> it, 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 it is up to us to do something about that garden. What will we do with that garden? Deep within our hearts is this garden that, that God wants to change. And, and to beautify. It's an awesome garden. But we're the ones that determine what kind of a garden we're going to have. We're the ones that determine what kind of garden we're going to experience. That when people look at we'll see, they'll see the garden. It could be the garden of sin where Christ is not invited. It could be the garden of sin where we want nothing to do with God and His Word. It could be that garden. Or it could be the garden of suffering where Christ is invited in, but he's not allowed to have his way. It could be that garden. I've seen that garden many a times where, yes, I'm a Christian. I've invited Christ, but, but there is no life. There is no joy. There is no commitment. There is no victory over sin. And so Christ has been invited, but he can only come but so far. You stay there. This is my life. That's your life. When I need you, I'll call you. Yeah. Oh, it could be the garden of success. It could be the garden of success where, where Christ is invited to come because without him we're lost and we're living dead. He's invited to come, but he's also invited to have his way. He's invited to rule and to reign. He's invited to, 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 to make the choices for us because when we made them before, we always fell on our faces. The garden in, in our hearts is dependent upon us. Notice the next slide. I want to close with this thought. I want to close with this thought. There's a story that I once heard about a Muslim man who had become a Christian. And, and, and his friends naturally asked him, why would you become a Christian? And he said, well, it's like this. Let's say you were walking down a road. And, 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 and you were going forward, and all of a sudden you came upon or you saw within the distance that there was a fork in the road coming. 
that there was a split. And you didn't know which way to go. And so the closer you got, you finally saw that there were two men at the edge of this road. One was dead and one was alive. Who will you ask for directions as to where to go? The tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. He's the only one that changes lives. He's the only one that enables you and me to take the right choices and to make the right choices. Every other choice we make, led and inspired by Satan, Lucifer, he's still around, my friends. He's still around. It's designed to destroy you and disconnect you from the God of the Bible and from his word. Final screen, yes, the tale of three gardens. The Garden of Eden, the Garden of Sin, the Garden of Gethsemane, the Garden of Suffering the garden of Joseph of Arimathea, the garden of success. And then the garden of self. This garden in here. I want to close with this thought. I don't know everyone here this morning, but I know one thing, that everyone here this morning has a, has a garden in his heart, a garden in her heart, deep down within, Maybe the garden is flourishing. But every garden needs a keeper. Jesus said, my God, my Father is the gardener in John 15. He's the gardener. The life giver, the life sustainer. God himself, Jesus Christ, by way of his spirit, can beautify the garden, can tend the garden, can maintain the garden, can fill it with flowers that grow and blossom can fill it with life, can fill it with joy, can fill it with purpose. If you're here today and you've never ever said yes to Jesus, if you're here today and you've never invited Jesus into your heart to, to mend the garden, to fix it, to fix it, to make it better, to fill your life with meaning and purpose, if you've never invited him to do that, you're losing out, my friends. He's a living Christ. And so if you're here today and you, and, and, and you know this is my time, this is my moment, I, I, I want the living, resurrected Jesus to be the one that governs my heart and my life. I'm tired. I'm tired of, of failing. I'm tired of coming to an, an, an end, emptiness. I'm tired of this, the sense of loneliness and emptiness and failure in my life. I, 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 I'm tired of seeking and searching for everything that seemed well only to let me down. Today, I give my heart and my life to Jesus. If that's your prayer, would you stand? This is your moment, my friend. This is your moment. You're not here by accident. If you've never invited Jesus, if you don't know for sure where you would go if you die tonight, if you, if you don't know for sure where you would go, if you can't honestly tell me, I know exactly where I'm going and I know why. If you can't surely say that, this is your moment. Say, Jesus the resurrected living one, I come before you now. I place my life in your hands. Bring your life inside of me and take my life and the struggles and challenges, take them away from me. The sin, the corruption, the choices that have hurt me, my family, my friends, my people, would you please come and be my Savior? If that's your prayer, would you please stand? Anybody, would you please, please stand? Anybody? In the name of Jesus. Church, be praying. Be praying. The devil's a liar. The power is in Jesus. Anybody here would say, Lord, I want to place my life in your hand finally. I've heard from my mom, my dad, my friend, my pastor, my neighbor. I've heard, I've heard, I've heard. And today I want to make it real. I want to start this day with Jesus, this resurrected one governing my heart and life. Anybody? Amen. You've done that already, brother. Just stand. You can stay standing. Stay standing for a moment. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. And I want to close with this prayer. If anyone would stand, if you feel you just, you just, you just want, to, you want to recognize more the agony of Calvary, the agony of that Garden of Gethsemane. Oh, it brings tears to my eyes when I read that. The agony, the pain, the weight that he carried for you. I'm going to ask you to stand if you just want to say, thank you, Jesus that we can celebrate a living Christ. We can celebrate a living Christ, but help us to never forget 
what you went through for us. We can smile, we can laugh, we can rejoice, we can, but never ever forget Jesus. May we never forget what you went through for us in, in, in the Garden of Gethsemane. May, may we never ever forget that. When we're tempted to sin, when we're tempted to give in to the desires of the flesh, when we're tempted to, to do something that's going to harm our bodies, that's going to destroy our homes and our families and our relationship with our children and our spouses and our families, when, when we're going to do something again that we just can't seem to control, may we remember what you did for us at Gethsemane. The pain, the agony, the tears, the sadness, the emotions. And may we remember that though we don't see you on a cross these days, that there on the cross you gave your life for us, bled and died. In Jesus' name, I pray for everyone standing. I pray for their hearts, dear God, in the name of Jesus. I pray for their relationship with you wherever it's at. Wherever they're at with Jesus, oh, grace of God, would you meet them? Would you meet us? Would you meet us where we're at? Jesus, we're so quick to wander. We live in a world that, that sight is constantly attacking our attention. But your word says that we're to live not by sight, but by faith. And so, Jesus, would you do that in us today, we pray. And we thank you in your holy name. Amen. Would you please stand for our closing song?
Hallelujah. Praise God for His grace. Amen. Amen. I was thinking how from the Garden of Eden, where was there, there was the forbidden tree. He went over to the forgiving tree to change lives. And He's still forgiving people. He's still changing lives. He's faithful. Jesus is alive. And there will never, ever be a time, if you know Jesus Christ, uh, when He will not be at your side. There's never time. There are times when we lose sight of him. There are times when we are unconscious of him to our own dismay, exactly what the enemy wants. But there's never a time when he's not there regardless of how you feel. Call upon Jesus because he's worthy of our calling and he's worthy of our trust because he is the eternally living, resurrected Christ who conquered sin, death, and the devil. Father, thank you for your loving grace. We bless you. We praise you. We exhort you. We, we lift you up because you conquered death. We thank you for sending one. The first Adam messed it all up, but the second one took us to Calvary. The second one went to the cross. The second one undid what the first Adam did. The second one conquered sin and death. He conquered our weaknesses. Lord Jesus, you've given us victory. Our victory is found in you. Amidst the chaos and the confusion and the ugliness of this world, may we take with us the banner of Jesus and introduce friends and people and neighbors and any door that God opens to the reality of the living Christ. We'll praise you and thank you for it in Jesus' name. And all the people together said, Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you.